We all know that lithium is the metal element in the batteries in electric cars. But the question is, will we have enough lithium as we build more and more electric cars? Why the shift from gas vehicles to electric vehicles? To lessen the carbon footprint, of course, but what new footprint are we making when we now rely on energy created from such a comparatively rare element on Earth? The amount of lithium we have on Earth is between 30 to 90 million tons. That sounds like a lot, but if car manufacturers stick to their promise of more electric cars, our demand for lithium could be as high as 20 million tons by 2040. But it's not just the low abundance of lithium, it is how we are getting the lithium and that's from mining. And we all know that mining and refining produces a lot of greenhouse gases. Also, who owns the mines? Should we be concerned that the demand for lithium could turn into fights between companies and countries? It will only become more expensive to mine lithium, and so its price could possibly increase to an amount that makes electric car prices too high. We could turn to ocean water, which contains 0.2 parts per million of lithium, but that's a lot of ocean water and energy we would need to extract even just a kilogram of lithium. And do we really want to touch our oceans more? I'm not against electric vehicles, but I think this need for lithium shouldn't be ignored as we require and roll out more and more electric cars cars. I would hate to see history repeat itself in our fight for a precious element on Earth. Pennies have been minted in the United States since 1792, with the first penny having Lady Liberty making a very STEM statement. Liberty, parent of science and industry. Our current pennies, meaning pennies made after 1982, contain only 2.5% copper and 97.5% zinc. These modern pennies are only plated with copper. The pre-1982 pennies contain 95% copper and 5% tin and zinc if made after 1962. Before 1962, the 5% is just zinc. These higher percent copper pennies have a value almost as high as 2.5 cents. It's always fun to find pennies that are older than you are. My oldest penny is a 1941 penny. I think the most valuable penny I own is a 1969D penny, which just happens to be the year I was born. His name is Alfred Nobel. You might recognize that last name based on the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize in Science. He's also famous for invite, in, inventing dynamite, and he worked with this, this compound, nitroglycerin, is a fantastic compound, not just for the sake of explosives with making dynamite that uh, Alfred did produce, but it's also a medication for people that have a heart condition. So it actually has a life-saving benefit to it. But this is nitroglycerin. And look how beautiful this molecule is. Look at that. And what's really important about it being so explosive are those blue, those blue atoms that you see, and that's nitrogen. And when you get nitrogen in some compounds, that does tend to make it very explosive. The reason is because of that nitrogen that gets produced. So when nitroglycerin decomposes, which it does really easily, um, it produces that nitrogen, but a whole lot of energy, right? So it's very explosive. Sadly, N Nobel, so Alfred Nobel, working with nitroglycerin in, the, in his lab, there was a horrible explosion and it ended up killing his brother. And not only that, there were many people through the story of Alfred Nobel's nitroglycerin dynamite that also passed away due to handling the nitroglycerin, transporting the nitroglycerin. So you can imagine at his death feeling incredibly guilty that he produced something so explosive and causing so many deaths that he wanted to leave a better legacy. So he established, I think you all know this, the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel achievements in chemistry, physics, philosophy, medicine, and literature. And so in some sense, it's a good story to see where, you know, his whole life worked with something that sadly killed lots of people. But in the end, he made the decision to try and leave a legacy of good. How would you like to have a plastic bag that you can store things in and then take that plastic bag, put it into some warm water, 
let it dissolve in that warm water, and then safely drink that warm water. And it wouldn't be harmful. Well, I want you to meet Kevin Kamala. So I'm gonna put that in that warm water, and then I'm gonna stir it. I'm not gonna say don't do it at home, but you know, you seriously, you can actually do this at home. <laughs> and as you can see, if I keep on stirring, and stirring, and stirring, and stirring. Within just 20 seconds, which was, you know, previously looked like plastic, has now become a green drink for a greener world. Cheers. That plastic that Kevin drank and does break down in warm water and safe for the environment is a bioplastic. And it took him, along with a group of researchers, four years to come up with a good way to make bioplastics safe for the environment and very smart, too, in production. They did this in Indonesia, and in Indonesia, there's about 25 million tons of cassava that is harvested. So they took advantage of that, thinking, hey, how about the cassava starch? Because I showed you in a previous video how to make bioplastic from starch. And they came up with a great process and now a very successful company, they've replaced over 200 tons of petroleum-based plastic just in Bali alone. Amazing. The characterization of the Mad Hatter, the fictional character from Lewis Carroll's 1865 book, Elsa's Adventure in Wonderland, evolved from one of the most famous chemical elements, mercury. Mad as a Hatter is a phrase referring to a person suffering from insanity. This madness occurred to hat makers in the 18th and 19th century who used mercury nitrate in the felting process of the animal hair used to making the hats. The mercury nitrate improved this felting process. This resulted in hat makers having high exposure to poisonous mercury fumes. As a result, both physical and mental illness occurred in these workers. Before mercury, Workers used their own urine, but the story goes that one worker was taking a mercury compound to treat syphilis, and as a result, his urine made the better hats. Thus, mercury nitrate was preferred over urine for making hats. Chemical Kim here down in Guatemala at the birthplace of chocolate. That's right, Guatemala is the home of chocolate because over 4,000 years ago, Maya grew chocolate and we have it here as the cacao tree. And I'm gonna pick a particular pod and let's take a look inside. So once you open up the pod, look at that. Isn't that really cool? But it's not, it doesn't look like chocolate, but chocolate is there. That's because the bean, the actual cacao bean is covered, which you can actually eat as a treat. Mmm, delicious. I then have the, the actual bean and we would dry the bean out and roast it. And then we have then the separation from the bean, the nibs, which get grinded to the powder, which then gets sugarized to our chocolate. And we thus have our delicious chocolate treat that came from our cacao pod. Mm, delicious. It wasn't too long ago that asking a doctor to wash their hands before a medical exam or procedure would have been viewed as insulting. The time was the 1800s when knowledge of germs was non-existent. So imagine how it was received when a fellow doctor told other doctors to wash their hands because they were the cause of their patients dying. These doctors were going from autopsies to deliveries having no understanding of the amount of germs they were transferring. Dr. Ignis Semmelweis, a Hungarian doctor who worked in a maternity clinic, hypothesized that there's something in the dead body parts that the doctors are carrying to birthing mothers. So Semmelweis required his medical staff to clean their hands and equipment. The death rates from his staff dropped to near zero. His peers refused to accept they were the cause of these deaths. The hand washing was dismissed 
as well as Dr. Semmelweis, as he was fired, had a nervous breakdown and was committed to an asylum where he was beaten by guards that probably led to his death. Those who first discovered and recorded the massive amount of white substance inside the head cavity of a specific whale first thought it was semen. That's right, semen. And if you don't believe me, well then why is this specific whale called the sperm whale? And this fluid, it's called spermaceti. Why discoverers assumed a fluid in the head cavity of a whale is semen confuses me too. During the 17th and 18th centuries, sperm whales were hunted for the spermaceti fluid, which was used for candles to provide homes for light. One whale had as much as 1,900 liters or 500 gallons of spermaceti. The procedure to extract the spermaceti was to drill a hole into the top of the whale's skull to scoop this out. Spermaceti melts around 50 degrees Celsius. As a liquid, it is less dense than a solid. Lowering the density of the spermaceti allows the whale to float. Echolocation is really the main purpose of having all that spermaceti. The first rule of working in a chemistry lab is never lick the spoon. Yet, yeah, because one chemist licked his finger to help pick up a piece of paper, a billion dollar discovery was made. Aspartame is used as an artificial sweetener allowing many food and drink companies to make claims of low or no sugar content in their product. Aspartame is not a carbohydrate and is made up of two naturally occurring amino acids which is produced in the digestion of aspartame. Aspartame was discovered in the lab in 1965 by chemist James Slatter who was working on anti-ulcer drug experiments. He is the one that licked his finger. Aspartame is 200 times sweeter than sucrose only 90 to 200 milligrams of aspartame is needed for a single can of soda. Comparing that to 39,000 to 45,000 milligrams of sucrose needed. And conclusive data ranks aspartame as very safe for consumption. When you apply Vaseline to your skin, you are applying a material that oil workers referred to as rod wax, the thick gooey material that builds up on rig pumps. Clean this rod wax up a bit and you have petroleum jelly or Vaseline. In 1859, chemist Robert Cheesebro visited oil fields and was fascinated to discover oil workers smearing rod wax on their skin to soothe cuts and burn. Cheesebro took samples of this thick black rod wax back to his lab for experimentation. He discovered many impurities and after five years of laboratory work, developed the proper distillation needed to remove the thinner, lighter oils, leaving his sample with a light colored gel that we all know as Vaseline. Cheese Bro publicly demonstrated burning his skin with acid or flame and then smearing on his purified gel to convince others of its soothing, healing effects. Hundreds of years previous, Native Americans had already discovered petroleum jelly and its skin protection properties. 